So we just finished shooting all of the flagship bows and crossbows from the top manufacturers in the market. To do this, we went to Lancaster Archery Supply, which is the biggest archery shop in the country. And there, we shot bows from Matthews, Bowtech, Hoyt, Raven, Tenpoint, and several others. Before shooting for accuracy, we tuned the compound bows and conducted the classic five-foot test, which we'll talk about a little bit more later. Then, a team of three experienced archers, including myself, shot all the bows for record from 50 yards. We shot three arrow groups, and we measured each of them. Then, we also ran a similar accuracy protocol with all the crossbows. I am pretty confident that no one else out there conducts a bow test that is as rigorous as this one. I mean, look at some of the popular YouTubers who review bows. They don't even put sights on them. Okay, so at the end of our test, we came away with some pretty dang interesting findings. I'm Editor-in-Chief Alex Robinson, and today on the podcast, I'm talking to PJ Riley and Scott Einsman. PJ is Lancaster's technical writer and video personality. He is an incredibly experienced archer, and he has shot and reviewed countless bows over the years. Scott is Outdoor Life's gear editor. He's a collegiate competitive archer, a former coach, and, well, all right, he's just a total archery geek. The three of us are going to get into the weeds in this podcast. We're going to explore what really makes a compound bow accurate, and we're going to flip some of those old ideas about bow design on their head. We're also going to take an honest look at the crossbow market to see if those expensive new crossbows are really delivering on their promises. Let's start here. Let's start with compound bows. PJ, could you just describe for us the bow that won our bow test this year? Sure. It was the PSE Mach 30 DS. It is a 30-inch axle-to-axle carbon bow. It has the a new cam, well, not a new cam for PSE, but a cam that they've been pushing a lot. It's called the EC2 cam, which is a smooth drawing cam. It's kind of middle of the road. It's smooth drawing, but it still has decent speed. Okay. So it's a nice shooting experience. But this bow just is one that has surprised everybody. Everybody I know who has shot it is like, man, this thing shoots so well. It's a 30 inch bow, which in the compound bow world, that's on the short side. Right. And you know, the common thinking is the longer bow should shoot better. I mean, right. Target compounds are 38, 40 inches long. And this bow just seems to defy the stereotypes and is able to shoot (laughs) incredibly well. You know, it's carbon, which you expect a certain amount of hand shock. Well, PSE uses this stuff called dead frequency carbon, just knocks that vibration down. You still feel thump, but it's it's light years from what carbon used to be where, man, it used to just rock your elbow. It's not like that anymore. Uh, so it's nice to shoot. It's quiet and just crazy accurate. Yeah. Before we get into the details of why this bow is so surprising, yeah. uh, Scott, give us the rundown of, you know, PJ said we shot this bow really well. Like how well did we really <laughs> shoot it? Explain what we did and, and what uh, what our accuracy looked like. Sure thing. So we did accuracy testing over two days. And first day, we really just cut the field in half. Everyone shot pretty well, but there was five bows that we really felt were top notch and we wanted to advance them on. And on that second day, we outfitted them with stabilizers. Everyone was able to just like really tune the bow to them and get the most out of each one. So each bow had everything going for it. And the Mach 30 DS, everybody shot under a two inch group with it. From 50 yards. So this is three different people shooting two, three shot groups at 50 yards. Everyone shot under two inches with it. It averaged a 1.5 inch group at 50 yards. The next closest was the Matthews lift with a 2.27 inch group average. And just to like, you know, and that was just like, we, we weren't sure if that was just like an anomaly. You know, how could everybody shoot this bow so well? It's not like, one person had a four inch group, another person had a 0.5 inch group. It was very consistent. Everybody was, you know, 
under that two inch mark. So we handed it to our social media guy <laughs> who is, you know, he's not PJ. You know, he's not, he's you know, a bow, he's, just he's a bow, a bow hunter, he's a bow hunter yeah. you know, just like, you know, a lot of people listening to this podcast are he last time he shot a bow was three weeks ago. And, you know, who knows when the last time was before that we adjusted it to his draw length, got him comfortable, sighted in at 50 yards. And then his first three shot group was like 1.8 inches. <laughs> and then we're like, all right, you got to You got to shoot this again. And then again, under a two inch group. <laughs> so I don't know <laughs> what secret sauce they're putting into this thing, but. It's pretty amazing for that tiny little bow to shoot so well for so many people. Well, and Alex took it out yesterday and it's 71 yards. That group was like one, one and a half inches. <laughs> I wish that I could say that I just do that all the time, <laughs> but I was as surprised as you guys were. Yeah. Um, okay. So we have this bow. It's a little bit of a marvel. We're all shooting it, the lights out with it. It's short axle to axle. It's very light. What about it has allowed us to shoot the, this incredible accuracy with it? Like what, what yeah. in the design, what's the secret here? That, <laughs> like, what can you tell us about this thing? So we should mention that set up with sight and stabilizer as we shot it, it was five and a half pounds. So we weren't weighing this thing down. There are some of the bows just bare bows that we were shooting that were in the high fours. And this thing fully rigged was five and a half pounds as we were shooting anyway. But so what we all noticed and, and, you know, what we noticed was at full draw, the pin sat still. It wasn't moving, which is rare for that short axle to axle bow, especially for me, you know, this bow maxes out at 30 inches That's where I was shooting it for the test. And so a 30 inch bow at 30 inch draw, it just should, you know, it's not that it's going to be horrible, but that's not optimum for accuracy, you know, typically speaking. So what we noticed was it just held still. So what's happening, PSE has built into their bows now is what they call full draw stability. If you've seen their ads, you've seen their explanation. I don't know that they necessarily do the best job of explaining what's happening, but what they tell you is it resists torque at full draw, which is what it does. And that's what we all noticed. But that's like the same marketing that any bow maker would put on their material. So like what is different about like, yeah, cause theirs actually seems to do something. So, no, yeah, so nobody else it? talks about full draw stability. They're the only ones I know of that talks about that feature. So what happens is they call, they say that there's a dynamic brace height. Okay. So the brace height of this bow, as we shot it, it's a six inch brace height, but we had a 70 pound bow turned down to 60. So the brace height was actually like six and three sixteenths. That's because we had the limb bolts back then. Real quick, could you explain why brace height matters in terms of accuracy? So brace height is the distance from the throat of the grip to the string. And the shorter it is... Man, the the more you have to be spot on your game in terms of accuracy. And a lot of it has to do because the, sh- the arrow is on the string for a long time. But it also has to do with the geometry of just as the string gets closer to the grip, then when you're coming back to full draw, it just wants to torque a lot easier. Sure. That's why target bows, you know, they're going to be seven to eight inches of brace height. Again, the arrows on the string for less amount of time, but also that distance, the geometry of the bow you're shooting with the string farther away from the grip, it's just harder. It's, it's not as easy to torque it. What they say about those bows with the bigger brace heights is they're more forgiving. Sure. You can do, get away with more stuff and the arrow still goes where you want. So what happens with the, the PSC, as you come to full draw, that six and three sixteenths, then I put it in a draw board where I drew the bow back and then you measure what would be brace height. So as we said, brace heights from the throat of the grip to the string. So you actually have to take a string and hang it from the cams as if it were the bow string at rest. Right. That's what you're Because now it's at full draw and the string right. pulled back. Okay. So you hang a string there and then you measure from the throat of the grip to that string. And with this bow, it went to seven inches. Mm. So that 
brace height that was six and three quarter at full draw was seven inches. Where when I measured, I only measured one other bow just to test it. Another bow in the group that had a six inch brace height actually went down to almost five and three quarters at full draw. Mm. So it's dynamic brace height actually got shorter at full draw. Gotcha. So just, you know, as uh, PSE has a graphic where they, sh- they just show you that it resists torquing, you know, who cares about all the, the geometry of how it works. What you want to know is that it works. Yeah. <laughs> and so the, I think it was that full draw stability that just, made this one work for us. Now they've had it for a couple of years. And quite frankly, we've always shot the PSEs well, the last couple of years, it's, I forget how many years now they've been working with that system, uh, but we've always shot them well, but just this, re- for some reason this year, this one was just boom. Yeah. You know, they may have had different cams. I don't remember what cams the other bows had. Yeah. But this one, the EC2, I think PSE has zeroed in that, man, this is the best of both worlds in terms of smoothness and speed. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, shooting at 50 yards, it was very noticeable that we were dealing with a, with a different experience shooting this bow. So, you know, we've got identified it as our editor's choice award. And we really believe that this is the best bow of the year by quite a wide margin. But I always wonder if, You know, it's PSC, it's not Matthews, it's not Hoyt. I always wonder if a bow like this has a chance to really break through and receive the credit like in the market that it deserves. And I think one of the things kind of going up against it, besides, you know, the PSC kind of underdog, is the five foot test that it has to overcome, which is how so many people pick out their bows. So Scott, could you run us through what the five foot test is uh, how the PSC kind of stacks up within it, and then why maybe the five, the old five foot test, isn't the best way for choosing out your bow, the picking out your bow this year. Sure thing. So the five foot test basically replicates what it's like to buy a bow at most pro shops. You're going to shoot a bow up close, usually without a sight or even a peep sight, and you're just feeling how the bow, you know, draws, shoots, how the grip is. And so we we rank the bows, you know, one to five on build quality features, the back wall, the draw cycle, the grip, and the post shot feel. And we get those scores in. And this time, you know, the RX-8 was, you know, pretty unanimously, you know, the best. This is Hoyt's RX-8. Yeah, the Hoyt RX-8, their carbon bow. Everyone loved how dead it was, you know, after the shot. The draw cycle is really nice. And so, which is awesome, is a, is a great bow. And the build quality is great. So many good things to say about the RX-8. But then we got out at distance shooting, and there was a different story. You know, like the, the PSC did well in the five-foot test, but it wasn't the winner of the five-foot test. You know, it has a, a little bit more thump to it you know, than the RX-8 did. It's not completely dead. And, you know, the draw cycle is a little different. But the accuracy is just insanely better than anything we shot this year. So normally I would say, like, when I write up the review, I'm normally very pro that archery is an individual sport. Everyone needs to, you know, find a bow that works for them. But in this case, this (laughs) crop of bows that we tested I would say maybe not. Yeah. <laughs> like just maybe just second go guess. With the PSC. <laughs> yeah. Maybe second guess if you're five. Like still still try it out. Like if it if it yeah. really doesn't jive with you, then yeah, you probably won't shoot it well. But I think most people will shoot it well. Yeah. Just so just to kind of put this in context, if we if we were if we had been the three testers, if we had been bow buyers and we had walked into the shop and had the chance to shoot at five yards, not really caring where we're hitting. And we had done the five foot test with all the bows. We would have all picked the Hoyt RX-8 as our bow. Yeah. I mean, and the Darton's another example of a bow that felt really good in the five foot test and, you know, kind of fell towards the middle of the pack in the accuracy test. And that's why, you know, when we review bows, we put sights on them, we tune them, and we shoot them at distance because it matters. And we, we shoot a lot of groups. 
over the course of this week to really make sure we're getting good accuracy data. So assuming that anyone listens to Scott and that <laughs> ignores, ignores their five foot test and, um, or, or takes it in, into account, but doesn't use that as their final decision on picking the bow this year. Do you think just based on like what you've seen in the past with bows that have really been special, um, but maybe not f- introduced from the biggest brand, how do those, how do those usually land in the market? Like what's the history there for, for bows like this PSE Mach 30? Cause it's a little bit, it's like well, a little bit of an anomaly. Right? Yeah. And if, first off it's carbon. Yeah. So that automatically adds, I think to this one, about 800 or $900 yeah, so. more than the others. So right there, point blank, you're going to knock off a bunch of people right there. They're just not, I don't want to pay $1,800 for a bow. That's just what's going to happen. And then I think, I mean, to be perfectly honest, you know, of all the bows we tested, if you're a bow hunter, you can be successful with all of them. Right. There were none where we were like, oh man, this thing doesn't shoot. So I think people can do well enough that I don't know if they will make the jump then if you're a Hoyt uh, person. So, uh, you know, I should mention the RX-8. That was the the single best group I shot was with the RX-8. It was like a half inch something. So, you know, you can shoot these other brands and shoot them well. You know, will they get past the price tag and, you know, if they're a loyal Matthews Hoyt Bowtech elite person, will they give that a shot? I don't know. You know, I, I, I'm thinking just as I said it, elite, if you're an elite person, this draw cycle feels different Mm -hmm. than what you're used to. So you may get into that five foot test. If you're used to elites and you're like, man, I don't like that. Mm Mm-hmm. Um, just cause there's, a, it's stiff in some different places. I, I'm a firm believer. I know, um, there have been very few draw cycles where I truly didn't like, if you can get used to it, I think you can overcome anything, but that takes a commitment from you where you're here now. I'm at the pro shop. I'm buying today. This elite feels like what I am used to. PSE may be. I may be able to do better with that, but am I going to switch? I don't know. Yeah. And talk about uh, PSC as a company a little bit because they're, they, they've found themselves in an interesting spot now where they have recently turned out some really incredible bows, but kind of didn't always used to be that way. So talk about that a little bit. Well, um, it's no secret that they just sold Pete Shepley, Pete Shepley Enterprises, PSE. He was the founder, been in it for decades. I don't remember when. It had to be the 70s. But so he sold the company. I'm not sure who he sold it to. Uh, But the guy running it, CEO Lonnie Workman, has been at PSE. So it's not like the person running it is coming from the outside. So they're coming in. And, you know, I don't think it's any secret that maybe uh, prior to about Five, six years ago, PSE did have a somewhat difficult stretch where maybe they weren't turning out the best bows. I know for a while there, they were really chasing speed hard Yeah, where it was, we want the fastest bow. Eh, Fastest bows rarely shoot well. (laughs) And I think people discover that as they get them, the speed freaks go, oh yeah, I want that. Then they get it and they start shooting. It's like, man, I can't hit. Anything as well as I should. <laughs> um, so the company has transitioned now. They're picking, starting to pick up legs. I I was just talking about this this morning. I hadn't realized this, but this year every major tournament has been won by PSE. Wow! Vegas, Neem, a couple of the other indoor tournaments at uh, the first 3D ASA. The Open Pro is the biggest category. Um, That was a PSE. So they make bows that people can shoot as, you know, as good as or better than anything. So the quality is there. I think it's just kind of trying to, you know, maybe the marketing is not quite what, you know, Matthews and Hoyt, man, they got their marketing down. You drink the Kool-Aid. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. You don't see that many PSE uh, 
stickers on the back of trucks. No. So you see plenty of Matthews and Hoyt. Yeah. Stickers. I even think of your social media. I, I don't know that I recall the last time I saw a PSE commercial come up in my feed, but Matthews and Hoyt's, they're pretty... Yeah, pretty steady. Even Elite now is getting more aggressive with that. So, yeah, you know, marketing definitely has something to do with it. It's will people take the leap and give it a try? Something that's may be different for them. Just going back to PJ's point about you can be successful with all these bows, you know, like the PSC, like this one specifically, the carbon bow might not be available, you know, like Lancaster, you guys have one in stock right now. And the worst group average of all the bows was 4.7 inches at 50 yards, which is... Dead deer. Yeah, <laughs> which is amazing. Yeah. So, you know, and again, that's three different people shooting multiple groups at 50 yards. So. If I'm shooting that in my backyard and just hitting four-inch groups all afternoon, I'm like, oh, yeah, I'm shooting <laughs> good today. <laughs> yeah. I'm yeah. feeling it. And that's... <laughs> I mean, these weren't ideally totally set up for us. We got them pretty close, but you dial that in. Yeah, you can shoot any of them. Absolutely. And they all tuned easily. You know, we just put the rest on there. Everyone shot a bullet hole. Yep. Bolt holes pretty easily. So, you know, we're shooting the Black Eagle Spartan 350. So it was pretty, (laughs) pretty straightforward as far as tuning went. But I have a quick question for you guys. So you shot the carbon PSE and then you shot an aluminum PSE that has the same full draw stability system. And they were both pretty close in terms of accuracy, but obviously that carbon bow shot about 50% better. So why do you think that was? I, I, I'm on a new kick now recently where I prefer light. <laughs> <laughs> it is. It was significantly lighter than the PSE Evolve 33. And I don't know, because I shot that one well. I shot the three lightest bows are the ones I shot the best. The Lift, the RX-8, and the PSE Mach 30 DS. So I, I don't know. There must be something to that. Yeah, some of that could have been the function of our test too. You know, we did a lot of shooting just a lot of arrows over the course of three days. True. So the lighter bows are just easier to hold on target when you're tired and you've <laughs> shot since, you know, <laughs> nine in the morning and now it's three in the afternoon, you know? Um, so I think that could be part of it. True. Beyond that, I don't know. It's magic. I think it's just, I think there's like a little <laughs> magic dust on the PSC Mach 30. <laughs> yeah. I mean, it's interesting because it bucks, you know, kind of, general archery convention of like a light bow shouldn't be able to shoot well, and especially a short light bow should not yeah. be able to shoot that well. And we kept it like we didn't load it up with a stabilizer. That stabilizer I have yeah. on there, I think has two ounces of weight on the front of it. I just wanted something out there. Yeah. We weighed it fully rigged. It's five and a half pounds, five and a half pounds, which is, that's nuts. not heavy. <laughs> Absolutely. Not. I promise you my hunting bow this year weighed more than that. Yeah. I don't know, Scott. A mystery. <laughs> I'm going with magic, a little magic. Yeah. Well, I think it's, you know, we got to visit the the plant where, you know, the ladies are in the room and they're handling the carbon risers. Got to see what they're sprinkling on to those. Something in there. Yeah. <laughs> we'll be right back after the break. Thinking of spring? Discover the beautiful white sand shorelines of Alabama's beaches and an abundance of outdoor recreation opportunities. Coast through miles of bike trails or tee off on world-class golf courses. Enjoy the thrill of a big catch when you cast into the Gulf of Mexico. Visit a state park or nature preserve for some hiking or bird watching. Most of all, just get out and have some fun. Make your vacation plans today at alabamabeaches.com. Okay, let's let's go to crossbows now, which is maybe the theme. If the if the theme of the compound bow test was surprising accuracy, the theme of the crossbow test is probably unsurprising inaccuracy. Yeah, yeah. I mean, so I started doing this crossbow test three years ago, and 
I was really surprised by, you know, we were shooting off of a bench, you know, super stable, rocks, rock steady stable. Yeah, at just 50 yards. Just talk through the the accuracy testing protocol that you do for these okay. crossbows. So again, it's multiple shooters shooting three shot groups at 50 yards. Each shooter will shoot six bolts total from each bow. And then we measure it with calipers. Again, it's off a bench, giving these bows or crossbows every chance they can to be as accurate as possible. And you guys were more accurate overall with the compound bows than the crossbows are as a whole. That's crazy. And again, shooting them supported yeah. off a bench, yeah, sandbags, shooting rest, every yeah. you know, every advantage possible. I would say three and a half inch group average is you know pretty common for you know a quality crossbow yeah. that, that we test. You know, there was an outlier this year that shot you know, much better than that, but yeah. So talk about that bow a little bit. Sure. So this year we did the test a little bit different. We allowed manufacturers to send, you know, any bow currently on the market rather than just brand new 2024 crossbows, just to give readers like uh, a better idea of like what's out there, you know, as a true buyer's guide, you know, it's the best bows you can buy right now. Uh, so yeah, the Raven R, uh, sorry, I said R26, R29. <laughs> We've been saying that all week. <laughs> the R29. So yeah, it's been on the market for a while. PJ did a review for it in 2022. Yeah. Yeah. So its largest group was 1.5 inches and its smallest was 0.75 inches. Yeah. So mm. it can hold a candle to the Mach 30. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Which is <laughs> saying a lot, I guess. Um, it costs a little bit more. It's $2,400. Uh, and kind of one thing we found in just crossbow shooting over the years is the bolts are kind of the X factor. Yeah. Um, and if you're serious about crossbows and crossbow accuracy, you know, buying a lot of bolts and maybe looking at some aftermarket options for your crossbow is, you know, that's a good idea rather than shooting just what comes with it doing some experimenting, shooting them all, calling out the flyers, and then, you know, doing that process with your broadheads is also really important. Um, I incorporated the broadhead testing, you know, especially for the the 500 foot per second crossbows because those, um, they're going so fast that the broadhead accuracy became an issue. Yeah, say that again, 500 feet per second crossbows. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. so I mean, starting with the R500, and the 10.505, you know, three years ago, those kind of blew our minds in terms of, you know, what was possible for something that shoots an arrow. And then this year, 10 point comes out with the 515. And uh, yeah, Raven has their R50X, which isn't available yet, but, you know, we'll be testing it in the future for sure, as soon as we can get one. But yeah, 515 feet per second with a 400 grain arrow and we were, we tested it with the center punch bolts which are a little heavier at 450 grains but it was still shooting 496 feet per second with those <laughs> and Jeez. so we did a fun experiment where uh, we took the R26 and, which shoots 450 feet per second with a 400 grain arrow um, and we took the 515 with those center punch bolts we shot Using the the, the top uh, mark in the scope, which is twenty yards, we shot at twenty yards, and we walked back to fifty yards with each one, and we shot again using that top one to see what kind of drop. Yeah, we're getting. so same same aim point, same aim point. Yep, yep, and same reference point. Yep. The R twenty nine. If I said R twenty six anywhere in here, I'm sorry. <laughs> just just know I'm talking about the R twenty nine. Um. It dropped 6.8 inches from 20 to 50 yards, which is not much. Yeah. But the 515 only dropped two and a half inches <laughs> from 20 to 50 yards. <laughs> so, yeah, that extra 50 feet per second that that bow has with those center punch bolts. I mean, yeah. It's insane. And with those bolts, it's shooting 5,000 joules of kinetic energy. Yeah. So, yeah, I it probably could pass through a deer at 100 yards. Yeah. Yeah, if you're okay. going elephant hunting. 
That's the one. <laughs> yeah. Or yeah. Okay. There's, uh, we're getting into the territory where people are going to start getting mad at us. So we're going to keep, we're going to keep going. You want to send your emails to <laughs> Alex? <laughs> <laughs> okay. We're going to keep going, but I'm going to put some, uh, some caveats down first. Just because crossbows, just because your crossbow site has holdover points out to 100 yards doesn't mean that you should shoot at deer that are 100 yards away. Okay. Everyone heard that, <laughs> heard me say that. Now we're going to talk about us shooting crossbows at 100 yards well, at targets. Well, before you go on to that, Alex, just to piggyback on that, yesterday I stood down range. Uh, behind a safe barrier, just so we didn't have to run a hundred okay, yards every time. Yeah. <laughs> those, those things are loud coming down there. Yeah. So you're shooting a hundred yards at a deer. I guarantee you that thing's reacting. Yeah. Cause it's loud. Yes. 100% <laughs> shooting at an animal in a hunting situation with the crossbow at a hundred yards is way different than shooting at targets. So everyone needs to define their own ethics and their own maximum range, but I'll just say, Recorded on a podcast that you probably shouldn't be shooting at a hundred yards with a crossbow at live animals. So from there, let's talk about what we did with these crossbows at a hundred yards. Sure. So yeah, the R29 was the the most accurate crossbow in the test by wide margin. Uh, so we wanted to see kind of what that looked like at distance. And, you know, so the, again, three shooter shot multiple groups at 100 yards. And the groups measured between two to four inches at 100 yards with something that shoots an arrow. Yeah. So, okay. So one one accuracy standout is this Raven R29. Yes. And that is shooting one and a half inch groups at 50 yards. And it's shooting about a three inch group average at 100. 100. Yeah. So and it, it, the rest of the bows are kind of averaging around three inches at 50, which yeah. is... Fine hunting, you know, that's plenty fine yeah, for, for shooting. Yeah, deer. 40 yards and in, you're, you're golden. But just not, it's just not impressive. Um, you know, and shooting, shooting at 50 yards with these crossbows, you can see your arrows, you know, you can feel the trigger break. You can feel that you're on, you're making a good shot and that the bolts just are not going right where they should be. Yeah. So... You know, we, we kind of have one accuracy standout. We have some bows that are, you know, getting super, super fast. You know, we still have some kind of affordable or more affordable crossbows that are delivering, you know, practical hunting accuracy. Yeah. But kind of across the board, these crossbows are not, the quality is not quite there, especially when compared to flagship bows. So talk about just like the general quality in the crossbow market. Yeah, just my experience testing these crossbows over the last three years. The budget crossbows, you know, these are bows under a thousand dollars. Are just there's a lot to be desired there. You know, they're not very user friendly. Some of them will have rope cockers still, which are which is difficult to use. Um, Derek was talking about his girlfriend having a hard time doing that. Even I have a hard time being six six trying to use a rope cocker, and then you know talking about plastic parts, triggers that are creepy or extremely hard to pull. Uh, like the, the center point we tested is $800 crossbow, not cheap, but the trigger on it is pretty bad. Yeah. It's very heavy. And I mean, it's all pretty much all plastic in it. And again, it's $800. And then, you know, you go to the, the Raven uh, R29, which is $2,300. Yeah. Still a lot of plastic in there. You know, it's much easier to use, much more user-friendly, much better trigger. But still, it's not like, you know, beautiful machining. You're not getting like hand-laid carbon fiber like you get on the Mach 30. Yeah. And then you go to the 515, which is $3,500. And, you know, those 10 points, they're made in the USA. They're, I would say, the 10 points consistently have the best build quality that I've seen. But still... A lot of plastic and there's the metal on there. Some of it started rust after being in the rain, you know, so not, you know, fully stainless parts. And so, yeah, you're paying a lot of money. Yeah. You know, you think of a custom rifle you can get for that much. Yeah. And yeah, it's just, if you have a great archery season where you live and you want the fastest crossbow and you have the money, 
I mean, go for it. But for the average consumer, it's just, there's not a lot of value, you know, that you're getting back for that other than super fast crossbow. Yeah. And then I think the other issue that maybe as more people get into crossbow hunting, more folks are learning about is just the maintenance required yes. that goes into, you know, keeping up with their crossbow. So talk about that a little bit. Yeah. Most, most crossbow manufacturers will tell you to change your strings annually. And I think most crossbow shooters, you know, they're not taking their bow out in the backyard and flinging arrows for fun. They're getting it sighted in, getting broadheads dialed, and then, you know, going shoot, hunting, going hunting, they're, you know, shooting, yeah. you know, maybe six shots a year at, from their stand. So let's say 50 shots total and new strings at the high end. Yeah. Yeah. And really, if you're shooting a crossbow that is, you know, 450 feet per second and up, definitely, definitely need to change your strings every season because yeah, bad things happen. I'm sure PJ can talk about things he's seen come into the shop that needing repairs. Yeah. Yeah. The more, the, the faster the bows get and the more of them that get out there. Yeah. We see a lot of people who are like, my strings just broke. I, I just bought this thing two years ago. It's like, well, yeah, you, you know, you're supposed to, you should change them every year. Yeah. <laughs> it, it's not a super expensive thing to get the new strings, but it's something that it seems like the crossbow buyer just thinks, Hey, I just paid $3,500 for this thing. You mean I got to get new strings every year? Yeah, I just bought it last cheap. year. But then when it blows up, that's yeah. not good either. Yeah. yeah. It's better to just get new strings every year. Yeah. And so what's, what we've seen, we've seen some people happen is it's just sitting in the case and the, the tension is just so high on those things that they'll come, you know, several months later, open it up. Oh, my crossbow blew up. Yeah. Uh, they just break. Yeah. There was, there was a moment uh, kind of in crossbow development where it seemed like maybe there was going to be a real emphasis toward quality, you know, you know, 10 point and Raven were, the, and they make, they make nice crossbows. If you're just like looking for hunting crossbow, you're going to be happy with, I think either a Raven or a 10 point product. And it seemed like for a moment, they're kind of possibly going to push toward just like quality and accuracy. But then just like, nope, we're going to go real fast. <laughs> yeah. When in doubt, yeah. speed yeah, rule. <laughs> I mean, it is wild. Like what they're able to achieve from like a, like a terminal performance standpoint is crazy. But there is the trade-off there. Is well, that trade-off is accuracy and quality. <laughs> if you push that back into the compound world, you know, the, the saying is speed ain't free. <laughs> you sacrifice something to get that speed. Yeah. Okay. Well, I think that I think that is a good um I think that's a good overview. So uh my final questions for each of you. So PJ, just like what was your biggest what was your biggest takeaway from the week? Like the thing that you're kind of most surprised or, or most excited about? I, I think it's because I had all the bows, there were nine compound bows that we shot of all different sizes and stuff. I had been thinking in my head since last year, ah, you know, my theory always was, oh, you got to go for the biggest one, the biggest bow. That's what you got to do. And just, I think this week solidified from shooting them all, the best bows I shot were the shortest ones. So I don't think I need that big, huge bow to carry into the woods every year. So for me, I think it was, hey, you know, those short bows. I, I think there is a point where you're going to get too short. We don't see 27. I haven't seen a 27-inch bow in several years. Now we seem to be hanging in that 29.5, 30 inches. And with the cams, they shoot bigger. But I think for myself, I feel more comfortable and confident now that I can go with the more friendly bows for hunting. Short ones, light, that's okay. And you're not giving up any accuracy. Correct. Yeah. yeah. Okay, Scott, how about you? I learned I know nothing about bow design. <laughs> <laughs> um, <laughs> yeah, you asked me yesterday, like, what would make for an accurate bow? And I basically just described a con a, like a target bow. So deflex riser, long brace height, long axle to axle. And if you gave me a target bow that could shoot 
a 1.5 inch group average at 50 yards, I'd be very happy. <laughs> <laughs> and that bow, the PSC Mach 30 ds is the complete opposite of a target bow and does that. Yeah. So, and yeah, you were saying one of the PSC pro shooters said he, he could win Vegas with it. Yeah. Which is probably the strongest testimony, you know, out there. So, yeah. Okay. Well, I learned that I was right all along. It's just the magic. It's just a little magic dust on the they sprinkle on the riser, and that's all it is. Well, uh, PJ, thank you uh, to you and to Lancaster Archery. Uh, you've been an incredible host for our bow test, and we yeah. really, you know, thank you guys for. We wouldn't be able to do this without you, and we learned so much from you and and from Lancaster every year. We appreciate it. Love having you here. Love, you know, everybody's interested in the company. They know you're here. They're like, what's happening? Every day I get questions. So, no, it's our pleasure. Love having you guys out here and to be able to be a part of it. The Outdoor Life Podcast is edited by Mike Peterson of 85 Audio. It's hosted by our editor-in-chief, Alex Robinson, and produced by me, executive editor Natalie Krebs. Thanks to our guests on this episode, gear editor Scott Einsman and Lancaster archery guru PJ Riley. You can read the full results of this year's bow test at outdoorlife.com slash bowtest24. The song in this episode was composed and performed by Pierre Locatelli via APM Music. 